And that's why he said, not by the blood of goats and calves or heifers, but by his own blood. And he said here, if the blood of the bulls of the Old Testament, Testament can cleanse the human being from their, from, their, from their sinfulness, how much more can the blood of Christ cleanse us and make us so beautiful in the eyes of God? That Lamb of God that the Jewish people have to select in the Old Testament, and still they do, to celebrate the Passover. And that Lamb has to be without no blemish. How much more the unblemished Son of God, who entered this veil, who entered this flesh from a virgin that was immaculate. The teaching of the church and the dogma of the church are not there just to be there are there to identify who is the Son of God, who come from a virgin without no sin, so that on Calvary, unblemished as he was, without no sin, he can try victory over Satan. How can you challenge Satan and put Satan as, a, as the one who is defeated when he himself come from a vine who was already defeated by sin? And that's why he said himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to the worship of living God. When we were, when we were, when we were dead because of the sin of Adam and Eve, because of disobedience to God, we were dead, dead to death, died to death. And our works was all works of evil, works of darkness. But by his death on the cross, he destroyed the power of evil and gave us now the new adoption. He made us children again, reconciled with the Father, so that together we can praise and worship our living God. For this reason, he is the mediator between God and us. He is mediator of the new covenant. What is the new covenant? What we are going to say in the consecration, this is my blood will be shed for you, the blood of the everlasting covenant, that covenant that is not going to be replaced, that covenant that will, that is going to be forever, because it was made by Jesus Christ, who is to yesterday, who is today, and who is tomorrow. And why? So that since death has taken place for deliverance, so he said he delivered us from the, from the power of evil and from transgression under the first covenant. You know, the first covenant is the first covenant that God made with Adam and Eve. And that covenant was broken due to sin. And now he is calling us and those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And by this covenant that Jesus made, we are now called to be children, reconciled again to the Father with the promise that if we become children, we are also heirs of the kingdom and have the promise of eternal life. My dear people, the Eucharist is the center of our faith. Because Jesus is not only present in the world, which we honor and we also meditate, is not only present in all of us, where two or three are gathered in the name. Is not only present uh, as himself, as among us, to unite us together, but he is present in a very special way in the sacrament of the old. We believe, and this is the very, very, very hardship of the church, when she sees that many of her members are denying the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. How many people today believe this representation? How many today they come to church and they don't even know that the real presence is there? The way we talk, the way we carry on, the way we dress in front of the Eucharist, the way we receive Him, sometimes even under the pain of mortal sin, the way we think, that although we are not married in the church, we, are, we can continue to go and receive Him. For those who are divorced and ignore the teaching of the church, with the church has the power because whatever you bound on earth and whatever you hold on earth will be bound and even released in heaven. They walk up the aisle and receive communion.
Saint Paul reminds us, you better warn yourself and prepare yourself before you approach the sacrament of love. Because every time you receive communion, unworthy, and none of us are worthy, but at least prepare without no more than on our on our heart, he is receiving his own condemnation. He is receiving his own condemnation because we are making a sacrilege. We want to be united with the Holy One, and we know that we are not because we are under the pain of sin. I ask you, dear people, because this is my last preaching to you on Corpus Christi. I am asking you to have great love for the Lord Jesus in the presence of the Eucharist. Jesus is going to unite us. Wherever we go, wherever the merger will take us, whether we stay here for worship or go to the new uh, form parish. Wherever you go, you have great love for the Eucharist. Make sure that Sunday will not be if or but, because if he is not there, you begin to decline. You are going to ask for trouble. You are going to ask for, 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 for danger. Because where he is not, there will be no peace. There will be no unity. I challenge you especially to, to guard these children and to give them always the guidance of Jesus, especially in the sacrament of the earth. Make sure whenever you can to go to Mass because who knows what is going to take, to take, uh, take place tomorrow when you are unable to attend. Make sure that you who are faithful to the Eucharist, whether you are in hospital or homebound, you ask that Jesus will come to you in that sacrament of love. I ask you to have great love, especially on the first Friday of the month when Jesus exposed for us to come to him and talk to him. I am not asking you that you don't use your materials or your things that you have, which are your devotions, which are good, but talk to him. You are passing by every day from here, going home from work or going on your errands. This door is always open. You just plop in the pew for two or three minutes. Tell Jesus to thank him for the blessing he bestowed on you. To ask him for his guidance, for his strength, especially in those moments that you have to make decisions. This is what the Lord wants from us. He is closed in that door for 24 hours, waiting for one thing, that we come to him and we go to visit the sick. That's why I always, and I always want, that our sick will be giving communion every single week. Eucharistic ministers, you are not here to be show off at the Mass. Your job is to bring Jesus to our shuttles. That is your primary job. Because that is what Jesus wants, to console our saints, to bring that joy of Jesus' presence in their lives. I challenge you all, young and old, that you will have great love for Jesus. Make sure you come and worship Him. Not only in Mass, because sometimes it's an obligation, but especially outside of Mass, which is the adoration that He asks of us. It's not that we sing in the Gloria, we worship you, we give you thanks. Why? Because you have found a means to remain with us in the sacrament of love. I am with you always until the end of time. And with this in mind today, as we take Jesus triumphantly in our streets, in our building here, to bless our parish, to bless all those who need Him, to bring all those who are away from Him, to make us instrument to bring those people who have left Him to His great love and unity with Him. And then we are going to see happy marriages. And then we are going to see strength in our family. And then we are going to see the sin of abortion go away. And then we are going to see our church flourish as our bishop wants us to be, to be vibrant and to come together after a week that we have served him to celebrate. And we don't look at our watch because our celebration of birthdays and weddings are not of the watch. We celebrate and we want to celebrate and we don't want the day to be finished. Why? Because our celebration is thanksgiving to God for all the blessing that he gave us and used us to be, him, to, him, to be his in the world we live today. May the Lord Jesus 
in the great mystery of the order, we always adore, we always give praise, and together with you, I say to him, and we together say, O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be ever more and done. 